Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Arjan Dixit. I'm a senior manager um, working on climate change and sustainability at Microsafe. Uh, we're also called MSC. We're very excited to um, have you join us for this uh, webinar. Uh, uh, Anil Kumar Jasser has also joined us, so welcome. Um, we are here to speak about uh, climate resilient agriculture um, in India. Um, and we have a, a great sort of lineup of panelists. Um, <clears throat> if uh, just to get some house um, rules out of the way, if you could just make sure that your mics are muted. Um, and if you have a question, please feel free to write it in the chat box. Or if you'd like to speak, um, <clears throat> just put up your hand. Um, there should be a sign in here to raise your hands. Uh, and then we can call on you to speak. Uh, we hope to have some time in the end for discussions. Um, <clears throat> we're here to talk about how we advance climate resilient agriculture in India. What are some of our key lessons and what, what some of the challenges uh, that still remain. Um, we're uh, joined by Shri Anil Kumar Cha, who's the Deputy Director uh, for the Department of Agriculture in the Government of Bihar. Um, he has a post diploma in Agriculture Extension Management uh, and has been working in the Bihar Agriculture service since 1999 uh, and has more than 33 years of experience in agriculture development uh, and has recently been selected as a IAS Carter uh, and has exp extensive experience um, in ex agriculture extension. He was a core member of the Agriculture Roadmap Drafting Committee for the state of Bihar uh, and he's a nodal officer for climate resilient agriculture um, in, in the state and has been uh, charting the way for integrating climate risk in agriculture. Um, he will be speaking, uh, he will be delivering a, a keynote um, address as part of this webinar. Uh, <clears throat> and then um, before, um, sir, I invite you to speak. Um, we have uh, Mr. Partha Ghosh, um, who's a senior manager um, for Microsafe. Uh, he's been with Microsafe, um, he has more than 30, of years of experience in banking, consulting, and microfinance, uh, and <clears throat> has been uh, working on agriculture finance, on green finance, on microfinance, MSME finance, um, digital finance, and business valuation. Uh, he's going to be presenting some work uh, that Microsafe has just finished, um, looking at the impacts of climate change on smallholder farmers in Bihar uh, and their coping strategies. Um, and then um, after that, we'll ask uh, Sri Cha to, to speak to us. Um, and then afterwards, we have uh, um, Dr. Uh, R.P. Singhanthupe, who's a, a consultant uh, currently at uh, Terry. Um, he has 35 years of experience in agronomy. Uh, he's currently working as a consultant, but he was previously working in different um, ICAR Institutes in India, and he's, a reti he's retired from the Central Institute of Cotton Research in Nagpur in 2019. Um, and his interests are in climate resilient agriculture, uh, including irrigation requirements for crops and cropping systems. Uh, so he holds a PhD in agronomy from Kurukshetra University, and we're very um, happy that he's been able to join us in, in a very short period of time because Ms. Surushi Bhadwal, who was expected to join us, um, unfortunately, was sick. Uh, and then after uh, Dr. Singhan Dube, we have uh, uh, Rajat uh, Shubra Mukherjee, who's uh, working as a climate adaptation and climate finance advisor for GIZ uh, for their CAFRI project, uh, who will also speak to us. Um, so uh, over to you, Partha, to speak uh, about our work in Bihar. Thank you. Thank you, Arjun, and I welcome all uh, guests and participants to this stellar uh, panel and the discussion on climate resilient agriculture. So before uh, Sri Jha moves on to discuss uh, the various interventions that policymakers and governments are undertaking in the state of Bihar uh, to focus on climate resilient agriculture, we uh, want to present a small study that we did in the very state, uh, which faces a plethora of climate vagaries ranging from uh, flooding to, to drought and uh, therefore what is exactly that smallholder farmers are dealing with uh, in the wake of climate change is something that we want to present. We are going to make a very short 10 minute kind of presentation. So thank you and uh, 
I'm sharing my screen to, and I hope it's it's visible. Yes, Partha, go ahead. So the presentation agenda today is to to uh, showcase the findings of our research. Then we'll dive a little deeper into the gender nuanced impacts of climate change. Then we will look at how formal financial institutions and informal financial services play a role in advancing the ex ante and ex post uh, climate resilience strategies of smallholder farmers. And if time permits, we can discuss the objectives and the methodology. So here are the summary of key findings. Uh, we, in our research, first tried to explore what are the direct and indirect impacts of climate change. And uh, as an audience, you might uh, you know, anticipate, and if you have experience of working with smallholder farmers, it's very difficult for them to perceive the exact reason why things are changing. I mean, most of it looks like a, a gradual change in a way uh, uh, you know, the, the weather is heating up, there are more heat and humidity, uh, but it has been a, a difficult research project for us to elicit those kind of direct and indirect impact. So basis, the, the, the study basis, the findings that we had, we were able to elicit that people can, or smallholder farmers can directly feel that there is an increasing intensity of uh, pluvial flooding and increased intensity of heat and humidity. Anecdotally, some of the farmers started complaining that weather in Bihar nowadays feel more like weathers in uh, weathers in Odisha and West Bengal, which is very hot and humid. And Bihar, as we know, uh, uh, in the especially in the north uh, east side of it, uh, faces uh, annual pluvial flood due to clogging of the river due to excess rainfall. So the intensity have increased, and so has the intensity of heat and humidity. Now, one of the indirect impacts that smallholder farmers feel uh, has been the larger incidences or growing incidences of diseases uh, among cattle. So last year when we uh, were there, lumpy virus was quite a serious issue, although it was perceived as a disease that has come from abroad, but we could see that there was a growing concern about its, its link with how heat and humidity is also excru excruciatingly increasing the discomfort of the animals. Now, when we talk about coping strategies, we understand that smallholder farmers, due to their uh, limited economic ability, has a, uh, has a very limited choice of coping strategies. So what we saw in terms of ex ante strategies, that is strategies that they undertake to ensure that they, they can, can cope with the climate events, especially flooding, uh, uh, they make sure that they have emergency cash, food, medicine, and enough fodder, dry fodder for their animals. They also look for localized relocation to safer dwellings. So in, in our country, in the state of Bihar, we see a lot of uh, advancement has been made in rural housing where uh, typically from, from mud uh, thatched house, people have shifted with, with, uh, uh, shifted with greater economic uh, ability to, to uh, concrete houses and brick houses. So those kind of dwellings provide uh, better shelter against flooding. Uh, however, uh, the exposed strategies that is with that is related more more towards uh, you know dealing with the losses in the agriculture sector dealing with the losses that uh, they face because of limited or or reduced productivity or or uh, say cattle uh, and animals facing diseases are basically to cultivate short duration crops so as to ensure that the overall mm -hmm. cash flow or the overall cash cycle of these crops can be minimized and they can make good the losses that they have incurred because the long duration crops like paddy or, or maize have failed. The other significant observation that we had that over, over a period increasingly, uh, the use of fertilizer and to a certain extent, the overdose or overuse of fertilizer is something that farmers are resorting to to ensure that the productivity levels are maintained. So we hypothesize that just because the production levels uh, need to be uh, you know maintained that at a, in the wake of changing weather patterns, which are not suitable for crop farming, uh, uh, in, especially in the Kharif season. Farmers are resorting to high fertilizer doses and high level of chemicals to ensure that they at least get the minimum amount of production from their crops. Then we also explored that, okay, what financial services can uh, possibly have a role in informing the climate uh, resilience strategies of smallholder farmers. 
we fig figured out that uh, in the state of Bihar, especially the GVK program has done a wonderful job in ensuring that SHG members get ready access to financing and uh, of income smoothing loans. And uh, the possible role that we see uh, is basically uh, like, you know, is, is twofold where uh, climate adaptive agriculture practices can be promoted through uh, credit, through institutional credit. And uh, in addition to the crop assistance program that the state government already runs, if there could be some inclusion of uh, insurance which are readily and uh, available and well understood by smallholder farmers, that can be of immense benefit and therefore has a very significant positive role in informing the climate adaptation strategies of smallholder farmers. Then we also explored the role of uh, ecosystem actors such as veterinarians, agriculture input buyers, uh, agriculture scientists, and other financial services institutions who are uh, located in and around these uh, villages and act as ecosystem players. So we saw that definitely the agriculture extension services and the veterinary extension services offered by the government of Bihar is of significant support to uh, the smallholder farmers. And in very few uh, uh, you know, countries, we have these kind of very detailed and in-depth uh, services available for free uh, for smallholder farmers. Uh, again, we looked at the role of uh, cash in cash out agents specifically, which was limited to an extent because cash in cash out agents said that, well, they would not go ahead and, uh, you know, trudge through the puddles and support or, or extend cash uh, to the, uh, to the, to the people uh, suffering from water logging, but uh, just by their presence being there uh, gives assurance to the smallholder farmers that banking services are near their doorstep. Microfinance institutions traditionally are helpful and they are ubiquitous today in, in the country. How, however, having said that, the, the, the services uh, do require some sort of uh, adapting to the needs of the smallholder farmer in the wake of a climate crisis, which currently is missing from the entire ecosystem. And uh, as we say, the other factors which can drive the resilience or can inform the resilience strategies of smallholder farmers are the ability to diversify livelihood. So apart from field crops and vegetables, we also saw that there were few resilient farmers who have switched to high yielding, uh, high yielding vegetable crops that have presently very high demand in the market. They're fetching good price. And there are a few other uh, farmers who have taken up job uh, um, in, in the rural sector with Jivika and been supporting various government programs. So diversification of income is also one of the coping strategies that farmers have adopted to apart from migrating to big cities in search of employment, which we have seen happening in Bihar uh, for, for uh, quite a few decades now. And the second factor we saw, uh, which can play a very crucial role in uh, developing or informing the coping strategies of smallholder farmers are the availability of credible weather information and credit advisory. So while the government of Bihar has come forward to provide a lot of these services, we hope that in coming years, these facilities can be augmented so that farmers can uh, benefit immensely uh, from accurate weather information and timely advisory coupled with, uh, coupled with uh, precise products and services that they can use to inform their coping mechanisms. So the next uh, finding is about uh, the gender nuanced, uh, like you know, attributes that climate change brings. So we all understand that women are disproportionately impacted due to climate change. Our study actually uh, supported that fact. It buttressed the, the, the fact that women are disproportionately affected. In, so you can see in this slide that in comparison to men, women have a various or multi-dimensional uh, impact, not only in terms of increased burden, but also worsened personal health and emotional stress. So Therefore, uh, out of the entire research, the crux of the, the study was to identify what are the major determinants of resilience, as we say, of smallholder farmers. So out of these seven uh, determinants, which is the ability to invest in non-farming uh, assets to uh, the quality of the available farmland, some of these attributes are derived from uh, natural capital, some of it is being derived uh, from physical capital and, and, and individual capital. Uh, but, the, but out of these seven, we 
uh, understand that uh, you know some of it which is really the availability of timely credible weather information and crop advisory and the ability of the farmers to diversify their livelihood holds the key to really strengthen the resilience however we uh, uh, like you know we would go ahead and undertake some sort of quantitative research to pinpoint on the weightages of these indicators uh, and and how some of these indicators emerge as really significant uh, uh, for for informing the climate resilience of smallholder farmers but apparently from the study that we did it came out very strongly that uh, weather information crop advisory and the ability of smallholders to diversify their livelihood holds a significant promise for enhancing the resilience uh, of smallholder farmers in the future so to inform these uh, seven resilient strategies, we adopted the celebrated or much celebrated, much understood five capital frameworks uh, proposed by FCDO long back. And uh, as you can see that human capital, natural, physical, financial, and social capital are the five key capitals that enhance the resilience of smallholder farmers. And while the quality and location of the available farmland is something that uh, cannot be changed or cannot be improved over a, over a short period, uh, but as, as I was referring to that, the ability to diversify livelihood, the ability to understand more and ability to get timely and proper information on a crop and also on the possible solutions, the, the chemicals, the pesticides, the cropping practices and also uh, uh, you know the information on uh, the the cheap and relevant sources of capital are some of the key uh, some of the key capitals that farmers can access to strengthen their resilience and uh, apart from that what was very peculiar in in uh, bihar and with that i probably will end my note is the availability of social capital so we saw that in this state, uh, a very peculiar phenomena uh, was put through by the by the GVCA project, the State Rural Livelihood Mission uh, project, uh, through the SHG members that forms a very cohesive network, which allows smallholder farmers, especially women, to access critical information, to access livelihood development activities, and also to access the necessary financing and and relevant and appropriate and adequate financing to ensure that those livelihood activities can be undertaken. So overall, I think uh, from, a, from a limited study point of view in a, in, the, in a state of Bihar, which is considered one of the most vulnerable states in India, economically as well as from the climate change point of view, we see that there are a lot of existing infrastructure that are already informing the climate resilience strategies of smallholder farmers. And uh, therefore, I would uh, request Dr. Jha, uh, Shri Jha and our other panelists to share their experience related to the state or sharing their national or global perspectives on how climate resilient agriculture uh, should be our focus as, as development sector experts and development sector uh, consultants and how we can take this forward. Uh, over to you, Arjun, and then maybe you can moderate and uh, ask Shija to comment. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Bharata. Um, thank you for sharing the results of that study. Um, you know, the focus on, on diversifying livelihoods, the focus on, on access to weather information, on access to financial services. Um, some of those things that are emerging are, 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 are very um, interesting, and particularly the role that social capital plays, um, the last bit that you were talking about. Uh, I hope we'll get a chance to speak to some of these issues um, uh, during during Dr. Um, Sri Anil Jha's uh, presentation and and through Rajat and and Dr. Singha um, uh, Dubey's presentation. Um, but uh, and we'll also have some time at the end to uh, ask some questions. Um, but uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Sri Anil Jha. Um, the deputy director to present uh, his PowerPoint and, and to give us his keynote address. Uh, sir, we will um, share our screen uh, to present the PowerPoint here uh, and just let us know okay, when please. you want to move to the next slide. Yes. Thank you. Um, Dipesh, if you could 
share your screen and uh, put the presentation up. Thank you. Thank you, Arjun. I'm the, the first speaker, Partha Gozzi. So welcome you. I also welcome Graham. I mean, if you can hear me, I mean, you are welcome to this discussion. And a lot of highly experienced people working in this field of climate resilience. So I will be much benefited by the kind of deliberation that I, that will take place today and uh, from this point forward. Uh, I will focus on what whatever is being thought about and whatever is being attempted in the Department of Agriculture Government of Bihar. And to be still more specific, uh, I will be more speaking about one of our flagship scheme that is the climate resilient agriculture program and the first slide has some meaning uh, you can see the project design is some way expressed in the first way while i am welcoming you the government of bihar is on the top top of it facilitating the convergence of the state agricultural university the national icar and the national central agricultural university and an international entity bisa so the government of bihar is trying to put up pull together the knowledge resources of all the institutions relevant in this area for the benefit of the farmers of bihar please next next slide Yes, as we understand uh, the climate risk uh, for agriculture globally and also for uh, more apparent for uh, our context in the Bihar. So climate risks are the two type, both the biotic and abiotic stresses and becoming very, very uh, obvious, apparent when we look at uh, our own agriculture in Bihar. So globally also and also for the context of bihar both biotic stresses are affecting agriculture and abiotic stresses uh, partha mentioned about the flood the drought and similarly the uh, biotic stresses many of them are becoming more more apparent like the fall army worm and the uh, even the locusts affecting the uh, farming uh, affecting last year it came and became a big problem and when farmers encounter both these set of biotic and abiotic stress then they will have the crop loss less production and ultimately will boil down to the the penury the distress of the farmer so raising their cost and increasing uh, increasing their cost and reducing their income all the uh, what is uh, the the uh, very analysis at the research and academic institutions they are telling us the policy makers in bihar agriculture that it is likely that uh, we you can experience 10 to 40 percent reduction in rice and wheat productivity by 2450 uh, and this is alarming this is a very alarming kind of uh, uh, kind of analysis that is coming from the research organizations and that's why that is a very interesting uh, subject and focus subject for us similarly the water stress that is though it is considered that bihar has a lot of water but then the alarm is coming from uh, global perspective that the temperature rise that will be affecting the uh, very availability of the irrigation water please next See, this is the climate projections uh, with the, uh, that we have done with, in, in, with support from the academic institutions. And aberrations are, uh, aberrations are quite apparent, both in the minimum and the maximum temperature. Both of, the, both of it is going up, and it is going up in the range of two to three degree. So that is very significant. And similar significant is the rainfall variation that may take place 
uh, from very high at some times the rainfall may increase uh, substantially and other times you have less and less rainfall so all of it will be ultimately affecting the uh, farmers and more so to the marginal and small farmers next see how that comes to the real world situation when we see the real world situation they have for perspective of bihar see the bar coming up going up and coming down so you cannot find a consistency in the food grain production and more so more of it is happening because of the rice so bar coming going up and bar coming down and you can correlate with your, the weather and the climatic situation prevailing in particular situation but this this is happening and this is the uh, this is the situation in which you have to act to and uh, secure the livelihood uh, livelihood option for the marginal farmers who are more than 91% in bihar next see how it affects to i mean how it is it affects uh, the department or the policy makers see if in the last 5 years every season the government has to resort to some measures because of the drought and flood or the hail storm or this cyclone or some some other situation where the farming situation was not normal and uh, uh, if you put together the financial help that government had to provide to the farmers it comes down to around one third of the agricultural budget of bihar so around 3000 crore rupees was spent on merely giving some financial support to the farmers because they were hit by one or the other uh, climatic hazards next yes please yeah please go so these are the some of the uh, some of the efforts that have gone into right now the some kind of financial help the input subsidy whosoever has suffered the crop loss so some kind of financial support goes out to them to give some immediate relief sometimes we uh, put in uh, some contingent crops short duration crops partha also mentioned about it also we give some kind of Uh, support financial support to do some critical irrigation uh, when when there is no uh, rainless period uh, long interval then of course the crop and weather advisories um, uh, it is one of the instrument through which we try to support the farmer and more comprehensive of all these approaches is the uh, climate resilient agriculture program which intends uh, in fact to prepare the bihar agriculture which is which is able to take the setback so when a setback is because the climate changes are uh, are taking place at such dimension that you cannot preclude that this this will not happen this will happen but how the agriculture is reacting to it so this scheme is probably uh, trying to nurture groom the farming help the farming to adopt the practices which will stick up the setback and minimize the loss so it is more more the adaptation uh, kind of agricultural effort than the mitigation aspect that was earlier the approach so next please go ahead to the next slide so this is the brief uh, milestones and how the scheme was conceptualized and where do this uh, scheme stands right now so the start start flash point is that the uh, uh, director general uh, simit comes and he visits uh, uh, honorable chief minister of bihar and uh, what he was trying to explain to the honorable chief minister was the uh, Ex uh, experimental findings of what they were doing at pusa samastipur at one of their center uh, where they were uh, putting up the experiments on conservation agriculture so so the dg is coming and uh, taking him taking the honorable chief minister inviting him to go uh, and come to see the 
experimental findings of the conservation agricultural practices that are being uh, conducted since 2006. So ultimately, the Honorable CM is visiting the visa center at PUSA. And then, uh, then he asked the mandates of the research organizations, all research organizations, uh, and he's uh, thoroughly convinced that this, this can be helpful. Uh, so ultimately in 2019, the government is approving this scheme for eight districts at pilot project. And these are the milestones. So the steering committee is meeting some nine times it has met. And after one year of the pilot, uh, the second, very second year, it was upscaled to all 38 years. So this is the kind of impact that in a very short time, this project has uh, been able to make uh, on this uh, agricultural landscape of Bihar. Please go to the next. So these are the uh, implementing agencies. Uh, as I said in my opening uh, opening slide, that uh, though this is the government of Bihar project, but the, the government of Bihar through its uh, normal hierarchical system is not implementing it. Uh, they, they have appointed uh, the four research organizations as the implementation partner, implement executing partners of this project. One is the Bihar Agricultural University located at Sabar and the uh, Rajendra Agricultural, Rajendra Prasha Center of Agricultural Universities at PUSA and the Borlaug Institute for South Asia and the ICR RCR. We also have the uh, tec technical partners, uh, International Rice Research Institute, SIP, uh, CIMIT, and more collaborations. We uh, imagine that in course of time, we will have still more collaborators on this project. Next. This was the pilot phase and you can see uh, the pilot was done across the state. So the selected districts so that majority of it is the uh, uh, drought prone um, uh, about six and the two are the flood prone. The Madhubani and the Khagaria are the drought, drought, flood prone districts and the others are the drought prone districts. So the pilot was conducted which can represent the entire uh, agriculture landscape of Bihar. Please go to the next. Now, after the scaling of, of the project, uh, this is the clear. So 18 districts, 18 districts are with the Bihar Agricultural Universities. Uh, uh, the 11 are with the Dr. Ayan Prasad Central Agricultural University. Seven are with the Borlaug Institute for South Asia. And two districts are with the ICAR. So clear cut division of uh, work is location wise and the job wise research organizations very precisely de uh, demarcation of job is done in the project. Next. The project has, uh, the project has complete liberty of operational liberty. There is one apex steering committee with uh, the secretary heads it and there is a project leader, project coordinator. Then comes the institutes, then comes the uh, KVKs and the project also provides uh, committed uh, project staff to work at the village level so this is the project design uh, which is uh, which is very very uh, very much builds upon the the existing structure added with some uh, critical intervention in manpower wherever you need a critical manpower so at the bottom level you find some critical manpower support to the KVKs and to the uh, implementation partners. The rest of the existing resources we are utilizing. Please go to the next. So these are the uh, these are the some of the um, interventions that we are uh, attempting. Laser land leveling, I mean, uh, it's maybe uh, it have, might have been done much earlier in the other part of the world, but then it's new to us. So we are doing it and a lot of advantage of it, I mean, need not to mention. So climate resilient varieties, I mean, the project also uh, is significant for the agronomists and the plant, plant breeders. What makes the climate resilient? What varietal characters will make it resilient? 
this is this project is also helping us to really define uh, in the very beginning what makes the climate resilient character uh, uh, i mean uh, there are some definitions but much more needs to be done at the research organizations level also precision water management some tools and applications are being attempted to and the precision nutrient management some of the planting methods are the uniqueness of the project so the raised bed planting and the zero tillage so these are the planting methods that makes this uh, this effort climate resilient practices a unique kind of effort then we have the some kind of uh, irrigation uh, but very small we have because the SIP is the collaborator, so also potato based farming system. We have some, uh, though the in situ crop residue management is very much cardinal to the uh, sowing method of zero tillage and the uh, probably the, also the raised bed uh, planting. But then also we are trying to have some uh, idea initiatives on the ex situ crop residue management. And core of the effort is the crop diversification, how appropriately we can devise the cropping system. So crop diversification is the uh, core of the intervention. And some of the other interventions that may be uh, guided by the project experience can be taken up in the project. Please go to the next. This is also a kind of uh, uniqueness of this project that we very clearly define what we are going to do. So uh, the next five years, the, anybody knows, the farmer knows, the uh, project staff knows, the uh, KVKs, the research organization that in the Kharif, in five villages, we are going to have demonstration, technology demonstration for 595 acres. On the same uh, patch of same patch same area same village we will have ravi demonstration for 623 acres and for the summer this one and the uh, laser land leveling for this one so we precisely know for a uh, medium uh, time period what interventions are going to take place and uh, how how this will translate to the farmers so the for the farmers it will translate to that some kind of help that they, they can expect for the quality seed for the weed management the seeding method and uh, if any other critical area that may be uh, there to support the farmer we also have a component of capacity building so we want that this becomes a hub of the uh, demonstration hub and then uh, it becomes a kind of uh, knowledge center knowledge center for the uh, other farmers adjoining uh, villages adjoining districts and uh, also some of the sites are catching the attention of other states also so we ultimately try to have this number at least visiting the, the site uh, site of the uh, cra uh, demonstration sites so kind of capacity building for ourselves next please this is again a kind of intervention. Uh, these are the 15 cropping systems that we have picked from uh, across the state. So some cropping system is relevant for some ecology, other cropping system is relevant for some other ecology. But these are the suggestive uh, list of the cropping system that is being practiced right now. And we ensure that uh, the cropping system, the crop calendar that uh, that has been devised is properly implemented. So it is not only a drawing, but uh, we this is also a guidance, a kind of calendar that uh, that we enforce. So that makes a kind of unique uh, that creates uniqueness to this project. Please next. Next. Anil, sir, is it okay yes. if we, uh, you wrap up in five more minutes, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Um, Thank you. Uh, I, I will take less than that. So uh, this is this is the uh, this is the, uh, the this is our experience, the crop diversification. So uh, the experience is that if you the traditional setup, rice and wheat will be occupying some eighty-five percent space, but somehow the project is 
squeezing it and uh, giving space to some other crops. That is the diversification experience for the project. Next. So in, in just two years of the project existence, it has almost assured that uh, much of the uh, plantation takes place in November only. And this is so crucial and critical to evade the terminal heat problem in Bihar. So that is the project experience and it is, uh, it, it is being uh, really appreciated by farmers also. Next. This is again, uh, this is again the experience that is important that put the same practices, put the same amount of uh, effort, same amount of money. Uh, if you sow your uh, wheat between one to 15 November, the productivity will be 47 and in December, it will be for 34. So you will be losing 13 quintals prati hectare. So that is the, um, uh, the kind of loss that can take place to the farmers. Next. These are the figures. I mean, I need not to explain much, but I will just want to scroll through. Please go to the next slide. Please go to the next. Please go to the next. This is, this is a long-term trial that is being put up at different locations. So at least we have 38 locations where we are uh, putting up the experimental trials for uh, the, the right now, the direction and imagination is for 50 years, but it can go beyond that. So these are the 38 experimental uh, sites, which will be exclusively researching upon the appropriate cropping system amid the climate change. Next. These are the, some of the ex situ crop residue management experiences where this effort is uh, integrating the uh, integrating the the different institutions and trying to uh, uh, collect the residue and use it as fodder. Next. Also, at some places, biochar production has started. So this is also kind of uh, new experience to us where we can really store uh, large amount of carbon in the residue. Next. This is the Sukhet model and, and it, it was uh, also talked about in the Prime Minister's Man Ki Baat. Uh, so this is also one of the experiences in the project where uh, an entrepreneur is there who collects the um, uh, waste is uh, waste material and then it's converted to the vermi compost and uh, then it is recycled so it's also a kind of ex situ crop residue management experience within the project next thank you thank you very much thank you so much anil sir um this was a, a a very good presentation of the work that you're doing but also some of the challenges that you were talking about in terms of decreases in yield, um, you know, falls in water availability, increases in heat, um, things will probably just get worse in the future. So our need to identify and really scale up the kind of approaches that you're piloting and, and putting up uh, is, is all the more necessary, all the more urgent and, and all the more important. Um, so thank you again, sir, that was very, very interesting. Um, with that, I'd like to um, invite Rajat uh, Shubra Mukherjee, who's the um, advisor on climate change and finance uh, for um, the CAFRI project um, through GIZ and NABARD. Um, <clears throat> Rajat, um, could you speak to us a little bit about some of your work um, in terms of helping smallholder farmers identify climate risks and develop uh, climate resilience? Uh, with a focus on sort of advancing um, climate resilience through building public-private, you know, uh, blended financing approaches. Uh, over to you, Rajat. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Arjun. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Partha. Um, and uh, I'm really happy to have heard from uh, Anilji. 
on the activities that are being done. Uh, Bihar is actually one of our uh, key focus areas in Patpatha, and I, we have been working on that for quite some time. And um, we are at the stage that we are closing for of our activities. Uh, so quickly, uh, what I work on is uh, supporting farmer uh, collectives, um, uh, farmers directly, uh, to <clears throat> um, to understand the climate risks that they have, uh, translate those risks into financial terms, which is uh, readily understandable by the farmers themselves and uh, can also support them to create an understanding of how impacts are, uh, are going to unfold for them <clears throat> and uh, supporting them to identify on their uh, within their own uh, region what sort of adaptation measures that they can come up with what sort of measures can they come up with that will render them more uh, climate resilient i don't have a presentation but i would like to sh definitely share uh, quickly of what uh, we have done on the ground and what we have learned from it um, I'll focus uh, primarily on our Bihar activities where we have worked in uh, three districts uh, with the MSC in uh, Baksar um, and with our other partners in uh, Darbanga and Nalanda. Uh, what we did over here, it was a systematic approach towards understanding how climate risks are impacting the agribusiness activities, agricultural activities in places like, uh, like Bihar uh, and other states where we are working, uh, Gujarat, Haryana, Maharashtra, MP, um, Himachal, in all these places. So our, our approach was to kind of go down to the ground and uh, kind of generate an understanding together with the uh, farmer community. So co-producing the idea of what climate risk is and how can uh, one adapt to it. Our <clears throat> focus was to kind of, uh, work with the farmer farming community to um, let help them come up with an understanding of climate risk so we asked them questions on um, what sort of uh, jal vayu parivartan um, that they see so this is something that they are able to understand so climate change and all these jargons that we've never carried uh, to the ground and they themselves identified so many changes that they have visualized in the last 10 years in the last five years and in, in fact they had these short term mid term long term kind of an understanding too provided that we communicated uh, the approach to them in a, in, a, um, in a very lucid and intelligible way. And uh, they themselves kind of came up with an understanding of uh, what is their loss and damage, so something that is not accounted for currently in the, in the adaptation scenario also, going down to the local area and trying to understand the loss and damage in financial terms specifically. So our uh, approach was to ask the questions on um, on impact in terms of basic basic loss, financial loss, loss of capital, loss of uh, uh, income that they are facing, um, just day to day kind of an understanding of okay, how much uh, cost that you bear at the input stage and how much did you uh, lose or gain out of that investment because I mean, and with the context of the background of changing weather patterns, changing seasonal patterns, and change, overall changing climate. That allowed us to build a, a cohesive understanding with the farmers of what is needed to do. So we even built a tool which uh, Partha is very uh, familiar with that we implemented on the ground, um, trying to understand uh, what exactly is the uh, quantification of the perception of, um, of the loss and damage that the uh, farmers have. Uh, we were able to identify quite a lot of measures. So, uh, for example, in Darbhanga, where we are working with uh, boat rearers, it's a all, all women's um, FPC. Uh, there, the issue was of uh, flooding and diseases to the to the uh, boat population. In Baksar, we had similar issues of boat uh, floods and uh, droughts, uh, as Partha also mentioned, that you know, happens in those regions. In Nalanda, it was completely opposite. So it was dry uh, seasons that, that are destroying mushroom uh, crops, uh, uh, for example. So these factors kind of uh, were identified by the farmers, by was were um, examined by the farmers as to what could be done by them to mitigate these issues, to adapt against these changes. So one um, issue that, that we, uh, realize and I think that is something that uh, brings us to what we are trying to achieve is to to draw a line from the understanding of climate change impact on their activity in the value chain and uh, to 
the exact loss in numbers uh, uh, in, in numeric terms, in, in financial terms. But once we kind of jumped over that barrier, we, we realized that our model should be uh, business oriented in the sense that we should be able to uh, develop a model where the business grows in the um, changing climate scenario, not just uh, provide a safety net of sorts. So we had to uh, kind of alter our approach and start working with the farmers with, a, with an idea of developing a business plan, which is climate resilient to begin with. So what sort of infrastructure do they need or capacities do they need uh, to ensure that they can focus on the risks of climate? And these risks need to be translated into financial risks. So we also supported them to kind of understand how uh, specific uh, climatic changes, um, whether changes or seasonal changes are in, in fact bringing um, financial losses to the, to the, let's say, because we were working with FPCs to the, to the farmer producer companies. But, but in fact, we, we realized that this can be done with SNGs also and with other uh, farming institutions. Now, uh, this is where the, uh, the idea of finance comes in because uh, ultimately it is about what is the affordability of these measures and how can they translate into uh, actual income generation opportunities or at least mitigate the uh, or offset the losses that they are making. So our uh, approach has been um, to support these farmers to develop uh, proposals for financial institutions, bring multiple sorts of financial institutions who, uh, who would look at, uh, let's say, the cash flow aspects of, of, the, of the adaptation measure, measures that generate revenue or measures that are purely uh, capacity driven. So uh, our supporting institution is, was NABAR in this case. So uh, sourcing uh, uh, capacity development grants, uh, funds in the form of grants from them, because that way uh, a non-revenue generating um, support system can also be erected for uh, these FPCs and, um, and be focused on funds that were women-centric in nature. So for example, the Livelihoods and Enterprise Development uh, Program which uh, purely focuses on uh, self-help group driven uh, capacity development and brought together women in the community. Uh, our tool, of course, looks at how socioeconomic vulnerabilities translate into climate risks for women um, in, a, in a very brief manner. But of course, we realize that it is an important thing. So we, we approach these specific funds. We also approached NBFCs, uh, banks uh, who were eager to loan, at, uh, to lend at a very reasonable uh, rate and also um, come with, uh, uh, with armed with uh, support systems of subsidies and subventions uh, and support these farmers to develop actual infrastructure around uh, protecting their, uh, uh, their produce or, or their assets. Uh, uh, so bringing in um, uh, uh, things like uh, supporting farmers to visualize uh, procuring um, solar dryers for, uh, for example, uh, in case uh, uh, in case of Nalanda, where during monsoon season, uh, the uh, the moisture is, is kind of preventing the uh, the mushrooms to stay uh, healthy or for, for a long time, or to have a longer shelf life, or to have um, um, climate control, temperature control, storage systems. So, can these FPCs visualize it, and uh, can they uh, also develop such business plans or models which have these aspects inbuilt in them. That is something that we have supported. And we have realized that blending finance is actually supporting farmers to, uh, uh, is actually making these adaptation measures affordable because one sort of financing can actually reduce the cost of other sort of financing and crowd in more financing because uh, uh, private financers who are more focused towards revenue generating activities would gain more uh, confidence if, um, if let's say uh, a NABAD is supporting with the credit guarantee scheme or, Na or NABAD is providing some sort of uh, grant to additionally over the, uh, the loan that's taken, which is reducing the, cap the cost of capital. So, and ultimately, of course, uh, working with the farmers to, to bridge the last mile, uh, bring in partners who can provide market linkages, work with NABAR to provide market linkages to, to access rural, rural marts and rural hearts. Um, this has actually uh, converted our project from climate finance to a, uh, to a climate resilient value chain approach, 
this has been the evolution of our learning also, that climate adaptation cannot be looked at in a silo. Uh, it cannot be looked at in isolation from the business activity of it. And hence, uh, the appeal is that whenever we try to work with these models, um, adaptation models with farmers, it has to be uh, conceived in a, in a uh, plan which is business-oriented, growth-oriented, which will generate income and not just provide a safety net or, a, or an offsetting mechanism for the loss and damage. And for that, it is also important to work with the uh, or, or generate capacity of uh, resource institutions and persons who can interact with farmers and support them to develop their own understanding of loss and damage. How to Why account for loss Sorry, damage. can you start wrapping up? Thank you. Right, sorry. So yeah, this was actually what uh, I was wrapping up with. And uh, thank you so much, Arjun, for, for, for the opportunity. Thanks. Great. Thank you so, so much, Rajat, for sharing some of the learnings and evolution in your thinking um, over the last couple of years. Um, you know, a couple of things that I picked up was around the need for co-production and, and sort of geographically specific assessment of vulnerabilities to identify what options could be. The need to have a, a, a future sort of um, orientation and, and develop business plans for, for climate resilience. The role of, of blended finance um, as a me, as as a me mechanism to make things more affordable uh, to farmers, and then finally the the focus on on not just uh, financing but you know the whole value chain and to take a market systems perspective when you're when you're talking about uh, uh, increasing financing and increasing climate resilience for farmers. So thank you. I hope we'll get some chance to have a, a discussion. Um, afterwards. Um, with that, uh, Dr. Singandupe, um, I wonder if you could speak to us a little bit about what you see as a as, you know, potential way forward, um, given the increasing challenges of, of climate change in, in a vulnerable state like Bihar, but also across India, uh, where you think uh, clear opportunities are and, and how policy and other activities need to evolve to meet those challenges. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for inviting me to talk on uh, uh, agricultural activities, which has been implemented by the government of uh, Maharashtra through Terry. Uh, the, particularly the project Pokra, we call it as a project on climate resilience agriculture. And in the Maharashtra state, they have named Nanaji Deshbuk uh, uh, programs. So in this uh, particular program, so World Bank has funded nearly 4,000 crores of rupees to implement this particular projects in uh, Marathwada region and Vidarbha region. In Marathwada region, nearly eight districts are there. And in Vidarbha region, six districts are there. And in uh, Nasik division, one district, that is Jalgaon district is there. And we are, the Terry is looking after the activities which are being implemented uh, in Aurangabad region, where eight districts are available. And in eight districts, nearly 2,600, uh, 2628 uh, villages are there, and nearly 374 clusters are there. And all the uh, technical activities, whatever the technical activity related to agriculture that is being implemented through the Department of Agriculture uh, Manpower, from the cluster assistant to agriculture assistant, then district superintendent officer, and then uh, main poker office, uh, Department of Agriculture. So this series of peoples are involved, and we are monitoring the activities which are being implemented in eight districts of the Aurangabad division. Why Aurangabad division has been selected? Because in Maharashtra state, Aurangabad and Vidarbha division, these districts are not, um, uh, what you call it, not well developed as compared to the western uh, part of Maharashtra because in the western part of Maharashtra, particularly Ahmadnagar, Pune, your Sangli, Sapari, Kulapuri areas and even Ratnagiri areas, where the rainfall is very low, except the Ratnagiri districts where the rainfall is nearly 35 to 4,000 millimeter rainfall. But in other districts, it is coming to 520 to uh, 700 and 800 millimeter rainfall annually. But 
in those districts government has taken up lot of water resource structures and provided irrigation facilities and the farmers are growing continuously uh, two to three crops in a year and even commercial crops also they are getting for the years because uh, because of the water resource structures created by the government of maharashtra you see the rainfall pattern scenario and water demand scenario in those districts western part of districts the total annual amount of rainfall rainfall is hardly 520 to even 3500 and 4000 mm but the actual water demand of the crop from 1st january to 31st december is coming to 1700 to 1800 mm so within this 520 mm rainfall of particularly ambadangle district i will be putting one example they are growing the sugarcane crops which needs nearly 2200 mm of water throughout the year because this is an annual crop farmers they are growing the uh, arsali crops as one and a half years duration crop lot of water they are adding to the particular those crops and earning lot of money out of the cropping system even horticulture food crops but in the maratwada region where the rainfall is 5 uh, 750 mm they are hardly growing one season crops that is in during kharif season the kharif season crops is not sufficient also to earn more income so because of that region government of maharashtra has selected this particular eight districts where the deficit of uh, water is there to take up the second and third crops as well uh, throughout the year period so the uh, through this particular pokra projects um, a lot of money has been uh, given to the different districts level to implement this particular agriculture activities in this particular uh, eight districts of the maharashtra uh, warangabad division they have implemented uh, drip irrigation systems sprinkler irrigation systems uh, your uh, horticulture fruits crops they have given the subsidy and they have created the water resources structure by uh, creating small uh, farm pond, uh, individual pond or community pond, as well as uh, Bandhara system. They have constructed Bandhara system and they have checked the uh, flow of water in the Nalas and crea uh, created water resources there itself. So that the, they have increased the uh, uh, open well water and they are now irrigating. Uh, during the off season period i will put one example uh, particularly this particular two dis uh, particularly aurangabad uh, division is dominated with sugarcane and cotton crops earlier before implementing this particular project uh, pokra project but what is happening now because of the irrigation resources and uh, micro irrigation pressurized micro irrigation systems those farmers they are harvesting nearly 11 to 12 quintals of cotton under irrigation system but under rainfed system some of the farmers those are not having that type of facilities they are harvesting only three to four quintals per acre this is the differences and those farmers who have been given the deep irrigation system they are harvesting nearly 17 to 18 quintals per acre seed cottony you see the differences how much impact have the pokra project has gone to the marginal farmers and small farmers where they have a land holding up below uh, eight acres similarly the sugarcane crops as well the farmers they have been harvesting sugarcane yield to the extent of 70 to 80 tons Earlier, they were hardly harvesting uh, 30 to 35 or 40 tons per acre. So this is the lot, uh, differences here taken place because of this particular rural uh, pro, uh, pokra projects. So we are monitoring the groundwater fluctuation, uh, which is occurring in that particular different uh, districts level because of the water resource structures and how best they are, farmers are utilizing those water resources available uh, with them through the help of the pressurized irrigation system and increasing the water efficiency because what is happening sir if you use the water resources developed through this pokra projects through the surface irrigation systems lot of water is going as an application last nearly if you deliver the water from main 
source to the field, the application efficiency is hardly 29 to 30 percent. Rest of the water is going as a seepage loss or even conveyance loss. Though the through the Pokhara projects, government has provided pipes, irrigation pipes, uh, and the farmers are providing irrigation through the pipelines and directly it is reaching to the field under the surface irrigation. But in the drip irrigation systems, the laterals and drippers, all these things they have provided, and through the drip systems, they are irrigating their field crops effectively without any seepage losses or percolation losses. Evaporation loss is also very low because the weighted area of the drip system is very low. Unlike the surface irrigation system, where the complete surface area is covered with the water. But in the drip system, it is being implemented at a specific location where the effective crop fruit gen is there. And we are providing guidelines to them how you can calculate the amount of water to be required at two days interval, three days interval, four days up to one week interval. Because drip irrigation system is followed at a three, four or five days interval, not more than that, unlike the surface uh -huh. irrigation system. So okay. through the KBK and to the state government department, we are advocating to the farmers to use the pressurized irrigation system and apply this much quantity of the water so that we can improve the water productivity component. Water productivity component is one of the major uh, part of this particular program projects besides the social economics and other uh, hydrological activities and GIS activities also. So we are working on these particular issues as well as we are working because now the government uh, through the Pokhara projects, farmers have made the groups and they have purchased the farm implements. Some 15 or 16 farmers, they have made a group, purchase the farm implements like tractors, big tractors, small tractors, your rotavators and cultivators, then uh, BBF uh, preparing machines. And even uh, other uh, small harvesters are there, combiners are there, they have purchased all these assets through the Pokhara projects and they are providing to the small farmers on for cultivating their land. So they okay. are cultivating their land in a short period of time and using those implements for uh, mechanization, as a farm mechanization. All yes. these activities are going in that particular program project. Besides, uh, we have seen last two to three years, I have been observing because of the rainfall irregularity, distribution of rainfall during the monsoon is very much erratic. And because of the region, particularly the soybean crop, which is uh, largely grown by the farmers under the flat bed systems. And in that case, in a medium to heavy type of soils, a lot of water logging is taking place. And particularly during the power development stages uh, in the month of August to September first weeks, because of the heavy rains, all these crops are getting damaged. And sometimes after the monsoon also, in the month of October first week to second week, a uh, lot of rainfall is coming. And that is causing severe problems to particularly soybean crops. And the quality of the seed produced by them is getting affected. And the, for the next season, June month, they are uh, farmers are not getting sufficient or good quality seed material for next season crops. So in that uh, condition, what happens uh, uh, that uh, farmers now they are multiplying the seeds uh, in the summer season. They are sowing their soybean crops in month of January first week and they are harvesting in the month of April. And those seed multi uh, multi uh, multiplication program is going on to the Pokhara projects, and they are providing good quality seed to the Maharashtra State Seed Department. And the Maharashtra State Seed Department is giving additional 20 to 25 percent more money as compared to the MSP. So they are okay. getting that of property. Thank you, so thank you, Dr. Singer Gupe. If you could wrap up, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, other other things are also there, sir. I don't have slides. Otherwise, I could have shown all the activities which are being carried out through the Pokhara project in those villages. I could have given, but because of the short period, I could not get uh, slides also. So this is my observations. I need uh, now a large scale in the Hingoli and Parvani districts. 
where the soil is medium to heavy in that case they have taken the you the turmeric crops as well as sugar cane crops are last scale basic they are harvesting turmeric crops to the extent of 35 quintal as uh, in under irrigated condition as compared to 12 to 15 uh, quintals per acre so like that lot of improvement has taken place and we are also trying to take up all these issues in a se second phase of this particular pro project government has already declared to take uh, will be taking this particular activity all activity in the second phase of okra projects thank um, you thank you so much okay. sir if if there is a if there is a powerpoint that you have ready um if you could share it with us we would be more than happy to circulate it to all the participants sir i, I don't just, just know one one hour before i got the message from the dairy of that you can just uh, give your activities that's all so i have just uh, gone through the uh, uh, project activities and that's explained to you because okay, i am uh, thank you. involved in that particular as agronomist i am involved in the particular projects and monitoring the activity which are going on in the particular uh, different uh, villages so I have explained my views and my results to you also. And it will be benefited, sir, definitely, because government of Maharashtra has taken the Jal Siva Yojana, that's 2014 to 2018. In that case also, a lot of uh, area has brought under irrigation and farmers. Okay, Dr. Singh, I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to cut you off because we are over time by 10 minutes. Okay, uh, sir. And, yeah, thank you very much thank for providing uh me to talk about this pokra activities which has been carried out uh, by the government of maharashtra and terry is uh, looking after this particular activities thank you sir thank you very much sir. thank you so much so thank you for talking uh, to us about the role of water in particular i think you know we we sort of don't talk about water as much uh, when we're speaking about climate resilient agriculture but it's hugely important uh, i am really sorry that we are 10 minutes over um what we had initially planned for um, if there are specific questions, we can we can stay a little bit longer uh, for questions. Um, if there are maybe one or two questions, I apologize. We had planned a little bit more time for discussions, but uh, it, we are over time. So I'll open it up for questions if there are specific questions for now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, John, uh, I, 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 at the risk of uh, taking too much time, let me let me ask uh, one question at least, um, because um, uh, uh, Sri Jha talked about the um, importance of operating at a value chain level. And I think this is tremendously important because Climate change is obviously a big threat, but it's an opportunity for us to transform um, agricultural value chains. And it seems to me that an integrated approach rather than a piecemeal one is, is really important. And I'm wondering what um, Sri Jar and Sri Mukherjee think um, are the barriers to um, thinking about and acting at the value chain level rather than the individual farmer or village level uh thank you uh, graham i think uh, i'm also uh, very much uh, very much agree to the value chain uh, intervention and in fact we are really planning for it uh, when we are um, preparing the fourth agriculture roadmap for next five years. So we are uh, speaking more about the value chain. So the logical uh, experiences of the, the two last two years, uh, we will be certainly doing about doing on it. Great. I'm, I'm really intrigued. Maybe a quick point from, my, from me. <clears throat> um, and this is an observation that I've made, especially working in Bihar, and I would love to also uh, interact with uh, Anilji uh, separately on the things that we have been doing in, in Bihar and maybe I can get some guidance from him. But yes, there are twofold uh, issues that I see why a value chain approach is has become, I mean, of course, it's important, but why isn't it being taken up so easily? So number one is that 
there aren't any institutional drivers on the ground who, 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 who build the capacities of these farmers and farmer institutions. So not just individual farmers, but farmer collectives also to, uh, first of all, understand from an impact chain uh, uh, approach, like how are, are the impacts building up in the form of financial losses to them uh, on ground? And how can they uh, identify these specific risks and find measures that will offset the losses that they're making and also create a growth environment? So both should go hand in hand. Um, number, so number one, yes, these institutions are not there or if they're there, they're spread too far and wide for them to come together and build a concerted uh, understanding of the roadmap. Number two, that there is still a lot of barriers for financing institutions, especially the ones the commercial financiers to see beyond the immediate risk that they have in the agricultural sector. One of them being climate itself. So crop loss, if that's a risk, why is crop loss happening? Because there is climate risk uh, to that. Uh, so at the moment, I mean, I wouldn't go out and say that, can you change the mentality of the finances? I wouldn't do it in the short run or the medium run. I mean, RBI has come out with its paper, there is push for uh, development of uh, responsible banking. In fact, GIZ, I have supported the UNEP FI to come up with a, a responsible banking institution academy in India. So, uh, but that will take time. That is not going to percolate tomorrow you know, on the ground. So can there be these blended approaches? Can government grants, supports or subsidy supports come in to reduce the cost of capital? that uh, and come in with credit guarantee schemes or refinancing um, uh, instruments so that there is certain amount of crowding in of, of, of these commercial finances. So there are market barriers, there are financial barriers, but of course there are majorly capacity barriers that have to be filled and institutions have to be established who can drive the value chain on ground. Thank you. Yeah, those are, those are really good points. And, and of course, as you say, agriculture is already beset with covariant risk and then climate change amplifies that covariant risk still further. So we have two other questions, um, Arjun. Let's try yes. and get them in because they're both excellent. Yes, um, so there is a qu question from Govinda asking about how um, <clears throat> the different projects that we've been talking about here, how they're linking with financial institutions in particular. We were talking a little bit about the value chain approach. Uh, but uh, maybe, um, you know, Partha and, and Rajat um, can speak to this a little bit. And then to Anil sir, there's a question about um, the way that you pick in the CRA project, how you decide on which interventions to implement at a particular place. It, are those interventions determined by some sort of a vulnerability assessment, for example? So if you could just tell us a little bit about the process you use to decide on which interventions uh, to implement at a particular stage. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can go with uh, Anil sir first and then over to Rajat and Partha. Yeah. Uh, see, um, the, de the design of the exper um, the project is that a Apex uh, research organization is backing it up to the local KVKs. So, Krishi Vigyan Kendra is located at the district level. So, they have a kind of imagination uh, for the uh, district. So these two set of knowledge start from day one, but when they go to the day two, three, four, uh, they are, um, this is being improvised through the local experiences. So five villages, uh, in fact, uh, a lot of modification will take place as they want to implement the uh, set of knowledge they had at the Apex institution or the district level and that will be customized at the uh, village level. So this is how the interventions are really being picked up. Uh, to explain to this, I mean, I just, uh, on the, uh, from the above, you, you may be trying that you have, you should have a kind of um, alternate crop to the rice, but when a situation arises, when there is a no rainfall, the farmers are waiting till the uh, last day of uh, July. So they, they lose the hope that they, they cannot cultivate right now the uh, paddy crop. Then they are looking for the uh, soya bean crop. And somebody is there to help them out. Yes, you can try it and it can be successful. And this was successful. Then this cropping system is being a big tweaked towards the change. This is the project experience. 
Great, thank you. Um, maybe Partha, you can start with addressing some of Govinda's questions and then over to Rajat. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very pertinent question. How do we uh, tie up uh, the need for financing uh, and the climate mm -hmm. resilience or adaptation uh, strategies of smallholder farmers? So you see, uh, currently in the inclusive finance space uh, or even uh, mainstream commercial banking space, especially in, in a country like India, there is a lot of focus on agriculture as a sector. So in our country, uh, agriculture lending or financing to smallholder farmers and agriculture sector is considered as a priority sector lending. And 18% of the total, 18% uh, of the net bank assets is attributed or allocated for this particular uh, set of activities uh, mandated by the central bank of this country. Now, this is through a regulatory push, but if you look at the inclusive finance institution and if you look at their portfolio, the majority of the inclusive finance institution, especially in, in developing countries, including India, are based in rural areas where agriculture is the mainstream or, or one of the key economic activities. Now, when we talk about risks on financial assets on portfolios, and there are umpteen uh, uh, examples of, of agencies in the uh, in the TCFD uh, and and like you know in in the global uh, banking associations uh, even even uh, with the bank bank for international settlements they're releasing papers on climate risk and how to dissociate climate risk from from the asset or financing portfolio so we think that uh, understanding the impact of climate hazards analyzing the risks of climate change on specific value chains that Rajat was talking about is critical for financial institutions to understand the risks on their portfolio uh, because of the translation of these climate risks into credit risk to their portfolio. And along with risk, there are opportunities for the financial institution to therefore create solutions that can help these small holder farmers to adapt. And, and there is also a very valid point put out by Rajat by saying that business need not to cope only with these uh, changing scenarios, but they also need to thrive and grow under uh, a scenario of climate change. So there, there we see there is an uh, excellent opportunity for financing institutions to mitigate climate risk through a very specific set of products and services and also ensure that there are opportunities through adaptation practices that are tapped. I hope it answers your questions, Govind. And over to you, Rajat. Um, thanks, Partha, for answering half the point for me. Uh, but yes, I mean, from the supply side, yes, what you said uh, is, is perfect. Um, I don't, don't need to address it at all. But from the demand side, of course, I'll mention that, as I said, that there needs to be some sort of a support for farmers to visualize their issues in financial terms and not just visualize it, convert it into uh, proposals, business plans that can be put forth uh, to financial, financing institutions, especially the commercial ones. Uh, public sector banks or private sector banks. So in, in MP, uh, we supported uh, farmers in Mandla and uh, um, and uh, other neighboring districts to um, revive their uh, minor millets value chain. <coughs> so, excuse me, uh, their Koto and Kutki value chain. And for that, we went for a value chain approach where we uh, tried to blend uh, financing from NABAD, uh, grant financing, and uh, debt financing from uh, from a bank with some sort of a subsidy and subvention to ensure that a cap, uh, some sort of a capacity for processing can be generated. This uh, idea was it was bankable because there was enough uh, a good understanding of what are the um, uh, revenue stream that can be generated from a processed version of Kodo and Kutki minutes and. Of course, our business plan included va uh, value addition, which we are, of course, training the farmers for at the moment. So generating demand for these financing, ge uh, generating capacity to demand these financing is important. And for that, just working with the farmers is not, uh, is, is not enough. There, has to, there have to be local institutions who understand the local ecosystem, the financing uh, barriers, the climate issues, uh, and provide some sort of a handholding or at least minimal guidance to the farmers and the farmer uh, producer institutions to, to access finance, to develop these business plans. And 
of course there are of course uh, examples across india where far farmers themselves have become uh, like uh, uh, community leaders to access financing like in in patan district of gujarat they are working with a cumin growing uh, fpc who has done so well in uh, in their approaches but uh, but yes that's not true for all across india so yeah institutional support is needed so a lot of capacity development and of course a lot of value proposition to provided for the commercial financiers because they are not changing their mindset so fast that something has to be done uh, alternatively thanks great thank you so much rajat that was a great intervention um we are about 25 minutes in uh past this <laughs> the hour uh, i think we will uh, not take any more questions um there is a a virtual club that we've set up on climate resilient agriculture uh, on uh, LinkedIn, um, that uh, you know, if you can join, that would be fantastic. Uh, and we'd all invite you to join that particular club. We'll have regular uh, interactions as part of that club. Um, so please, uh, <clears throat> we'll share the link uh, again here on on the chat. Uh, but uh, thank you so much to um, Anil Jhasar, uh, to Rajat, to Dr. Um, Arvi Singh Adupe, uh, and to Partha. Um, for for taking the time to speak to us, um, and then I'll hand it over to Graham for his final vote of thanks, um, and we'll close. Thank you. Great. I'm sure you're all desperate to go and do some real work. So um, let me just thank you all, and in particular our speakers. It is such a privilege to have um, such luminaries and thought leaders in uh, in this area. Um, working with us and, and, and presenting to us. And I'm deeply, deeply grateful to all three of you for taking the time to share your knowledge, uh, insights and, and wisdom with us. And I really hope that we can continue to work together um, to, to uh, particularly in Bihabata beyond, um, to, to address the challenge of climate change for smallholder farmers. Uh, it is getting more and more uh critical and i have to say that uh having done research both in bihar and bangladesh and also um, nigeria um what is happening to smallholder farmers is profoundly alarming and we need to work together as quickly as possible to address this problem so with that um not very <laughs> happy note um let me sign off and thank you all again for for joining us it's been an absolutely tremendous uh webinar thank you all <laughs>